impulses are being redirected. We are living in an artificially induced state of consciousness that resembles sleep. Oh, damned hacker, that second time night that asshole's got in. He's giving me a headache. Yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> that took the hackers months to figure out how to do this. The poor and the underclass are growing. Racial justice and human rights are non-existent. They have created a repressive society, and we are their unwitting accomplices. Please understand, they are safe as long as they are not discovered. That is their primary method of survival. Keep us asleep, keep us selfish, keep us sedated. Thank you for tuning in to the Boer Republic podcast. We're very lucky to have Jonas Nilsson joining us for an interesting discussion regarding his work here in South Africa and as well as his native Sweden, the connections between the two countries and much more. Jonas has done a great deal of work in spreading information and truth about the realities in South Africa, culminating in his excellent Boer Project documentary. He has since released many interviews and insights regarding South Africa on his YouTube channel via his media initiative called Palestra Media. He is also the author of Anarcho-Fascism, Nature Reborn, which we will be touching upon during the interview. We will also be drawing attention to his upcoming conference in part with his Boer Project documentary called A Way Forward, which will be held in Stockholm, Sweden on the 12th of August 2018. Thank you for joining us, Jonas. It's a pleasure to have you on the podcast with us. Thank you, and it's an honor to be on the show. Thanks. So just to give the audience an idea of uh, where you're coming from, what your interests are, and just a bit about your background, especially where South Africa is concerned, please just tell the audience a bit about yourself. Yeah, my name is Jonas Nilsson. I'm uh, 34 years old, and uh, I got a uh, political science degree from the Swedish National Defense University. On my spare time, I am an MMA fighter. I uh, was uh, elected to a Swedish national team, but uh, got rejected uh, due to political correct reasons of due to my engagement in the political opposition. And uh, it's there where I put uh, most of my work and uh, most of my effort to try to create a change of the narrative and the political discourse that we have uh, here in Sweden. And uh, of course, I use South Africa as an example of where my country and Europe and the entire Western world will head for if we uh, don't deal with this uh, migrant crisis and this change of demographic that will lead uh, for the white man to become a minority in its own country. And uh, South Africa highlights that perfectly, that the minority rights that we put forward to uh, take care of the people that come to our, our shores that those uh, rights will not disappear when they become the majority. They will rather be increased. So, so that that is like the main reason why why I do all the work that I do and everything I do pretty much oriented towards that. And with that in mind, is the main reason why I have invited over four South Africans for a conference here in Stockholm now on Sunday, the twelfth of August. And uh, amongst the speakers is the president of uh, Orania, Karel Bosov. And uh, he, it's, he, he will put forward an interesting uh, case, uh, a case study of what uh, he have done with uh, Orania as, uh, as an uh, OAS middle in nowhere in South Africa, which is segregated from the rest of society where uh, Afrikaner people can live amongst other Afrikaners. And it's interesting in in the Swedish context, because people in Sweden, in our opposition, is starting to think about how can we segregate ourselves from the problem that we have in society, but at the same time be part of society and uh, be able to oppose the, polit- the rest of the political climate and try to get a change within the parliament structure. So um, I think... Uh, if you regard South Africa as a possible future to where Europe and Sweden are heading, then it's very important to listen to the South Africans 
because then it's lit- literally like listen to people that have walked before us because you're facing problem that we will be facing if nothing is uh, being done. So uh, I hope for a great conversation and uh, good publis- publicity this uh, this Sunday in uh, Stockholm, Sweden, and uh, all the speeches and the discussion that will follow will be posted on my YouTube channel afterwards in the week to come on Palestra Media. Your conference is an excellent way of of bringing publicity, bringing attention to some of the realities that we face here in South Africa. Could you please tell the audience just a a bit more about some of the speakers that you have uh, attending the conference? Yeah, so, um, yeah, Karl Bosov, of course, and uh, the second speaker is uh, Mr. Paul Kruger, the lawyer from uh, the Folk Commission uh, that uh, put forward the parallel election within the Boer community where you can elect the representative to a Volksrad, uh, where seven people... Because what the Mr. Kruger said to me was that uh, when you had a new government in place uh, under the ANC rule, and uh, the Boer community tried to make like a claim to, to land or to certain rights, one of the major critiques he, uh, they received from the authority was that with whom shall we negotiate? who is the one that uh, speaks on the behalf of the Boer community. So uh, the Folk Commission solved this problem or dilemma or whatever you want to frame it by electing their own representative into this folk crowd, which will be able to negotiate on a broader basis of representing the Boer community. And that that will be very interesting to hear about uh, that work and what uh, uh, process they have made in actually being acknowledged by the authorities. And uh, beside them, we have uh, Henri Le Rich. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. And uh, he, has a, he has a quite interesting story because he's very like Swedish, uh, not, not to insult him, but uh, he's a very Swedish in his way of thinking. Like uh, he was a liberal back in the day and he voted yes in the referendum of 1992. But today he's uh, a member of... Uh, paramilitary group and uh, he's up for a fight and uh, that's some major transformation that have taken part during these 20 years of actually realizing something that is not right with with the country and I think that speech that he will deliver can really relate to many Swedish people that actually also uh, within the safety of our own community living across the world in a homogenous country supporting ANC on uh, during the apartheid time on basis of like equally equality and human rights and uh, such that we maybe delivered answers to questions that we couldn't relate to ourselves that you really need to like get burn from the consequences a little bit to actually realize where you're heading and uh, how you're going to deal with it and uh, also Le Rich has a British passport which means that he could leave and apply for work in European Union, but still he chooses to, to stay because South Africa is his uh, native land. And uh, our fourth speaker is uh, Mariandra Heines from uh, Support for the uh, Aid Organization for uh, uh, people that have survived farm attacks and are closely linked to, to the Afri Forum. And uh, she, she will... Uh, she is also a victim of a farm attack and uh, got her husband executed in front of her eyes and in front of her children's eyes. So she will tell us about how she overcome that situation and uh, how she's aiding other people that now are uh, are lost in uh, have lost themselves in a in a farm attack and how they can work their way forward from that. And unfortunately, farm murders and the increased violence in South Africa is is a grim reminder of what multiculturalism can lead to. And in that respect, your conference sounds like an excellent way of aiding South Africans as well as uh, Swedes in understanding that the West at large, uh, what remains of the West and what used to be the West and uh, particularly what um, we all experience as uh, people of European descent as whites, 
what we face when experienced with increased demographic shifts. Uh, farm it is, is a stark reality, and I'm sure it will be an interesting uh, listen for those attending the conference. The other aspects uh, that that we find quite interesting is that you've got you know speakers like uh, Karl Borsov. We've had the privilege of interviewing um, interviewing him ourselves uh, when we visited Urania, when we spoke with him at the Nampu Agricultural uh, Expo in. Um, Boerteville earlier this year, and it, to see sort of that that unity of community of consolidating that that people can get to is 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 good to see in times like these. And it's good that uh, you've got such such good guests at this conference. Those that might still want to attend that that aren't aware of it, where can they go to find out more about uh, attending the conference? Yeah. The- if it's anyone that is in the Stockholm region and uh, listening to this and uh, want to come to the conference, the best way is to go into my publishing house uh, webpage, which is uh, logic.se, and that is logic with a K, not with a C. C. And uh, information of the conference is on the front page there. So that, that would be the best way. And uh, like another like very interesting side effect to this conference is when you get this awareness of what's happening in South Africa, where we actually have a faucet at hand. What's happened when when you give your country over to to an outgroup of your own, and especially if it's uh, communists or uh, extreme left leaning socialists, is that uh, Sweden as a government back in the 70s and 80s were very heavily invested in aiding Nelson Mandela and the, and the ANC in their struggle against apartheid, which makes it very hard for us to acknowledge the present situation of the, of, of the challenges that is within the government itself with the corruption that are in the South African government and the corruption within the party of ANC. Because of our tied history, South Africa is the biggest uh, weapons buyer from Swedish manufactured arms. Arms that you're flying our uh, uh, attack uh, air flights, the Griffins, and uh, you're buying our our Marines. And it's uh, we have very strict rules of uh, who are we are selling arms to under normal circumstances. We're, we're not allowed to sell to whichever country there is. And it's also like if we were to acknowledge that South Africa has domestic problem with actually uh, answering for the protection of its own citizen, it would also mean that we need to revive lots of uh, things that is financially beneficial for, for Sweden, which is this kind of arm deals, which is multi-billion dollar deals. That, that's an important point to make, but... Just to give the audience an idea of those that aren't aware of what's going on in Sweden at the moment, especially where multiculturalism is concerned. Uh, could you just give us a bit of a background and also as to why South Africa and Sweden situations are quite similar? It's uh, Sweden was a very homogenous country uh, just until the early 90s. It was, if you went to Sweden, it's you had a pretty clear picture of what Sweden was. It was a high trust society, which were very, very safe. And that's the Sweden that I grew up in. We didn't lock our door when we went out and uh, it was very, very easy going. And uh, what happened in the, in the 90s and the early eight, uh, late 80s was that we got a decision implemented upon us by uh, Olof Palme, the, the, the person that personified the, the international support for the ANC. And that the parliamentary decision, which was later uh, written into our constitution, was that we were from now forward going to be a multicultural state. And uh, today we're suffering from that. Uh, we have no, no-go zones in uh, outside each uh, big region where uh, even police need a police escort to enter. The, and the reason being if the police go in there alone and they leave their vehicle, the vehicle will be vandalized. So there we have region in Stockholm where uh, if a police is going to go in there, they need a police escort. So when the first police uh, officer leaves their car, the other police officer can watch the two cars. And the same with ambulance and uh, with the fire departments. If they get an alarm into this region, they need the police escort. 
And uh, this, of course, is directly related to the multicultural society that we have uh, opposed on, onto ourselves. So it's already self-inflicted policies that we're suffering from. And uh, at present day, we are around 9 million habitats in Sweden. And uh, it's maybe somewhere around 7 and 8 to those million that are actual Swedes. And uh, over between 10 to 20% are, are foreigners. And most of them is from Middle East or North Africa. So uh, we're going in a very, very fast way to uh, to become a minority in uh, in our own country. And it's... Uh, it's going very fast. And we have uh, our election now uh, in uh, the second week in September. And that's also like a reason why I put uh, this conference before the election. So uh, it can stand like a warning that uh, because what you do on election day, that the vote of your, that actually holds some power over others because that's what like politics are in its essence. And uh, in the same way, you voted your way, country away in 92. We are just about to vote away our country here in Sweden, because if nothing is being done, it's just another 10, 15 years. And we are uh, quite literally a minority in our own country. So we need to act fast because time is not on our side. And, um, and Jonas, just give me a summary, maybe of the state of free speech within the country. And maybe what is, is there any acknowledgement amongst the public of this problem or are they allowed to acknowledge them? Do they do it only privately to, to, to friends and family or what is your ability at the moment to, to publicly talk about these issues? That uh, yeah, the, the free speech in Sweden is, uh, if you look at the legislations, it's pretty, pretty all right. Of course, like hate speech only goes one way. Uh, it's only a Swede uh, offending a minority that can be convicted for hate speech, not the other way around. We can we have immigrant gangs that raping white girls and uh, is quite outspoken with that uh, they are attacking this Swedish girl because they are Swedish, uh, which in itself is is a pure hate crime. Not not too far off uh, what what we see in South Africa as well uh, within the farm community and. Uh, I think, I think like in, in the legislation, besides that, uh, hate speech law, it's, it's pretty right. You're, you're, you're allowed to speak your mind, but, uh, it comes with a cost. It's, it's more like the cost of ostracism, uh, mm. that makes people uh, think twice about what they say, not the cost of, uh, being arrested or being sentenced and put to a fine, even though we see an increase in this last couple of years because People are getting more and more worried and becomes more free outspoken. And it's just gotten to a degree where people express their feelings on the social media platforms such as Facebook and especially amongst the older generation. And that's a generation that has uh, had a very high trust to the a respect for the authority and a respect for the police. And now they write their concern on Facebook and suddenly uh, you are 60 or 70 years old and now you find yourself at a police interrogation because of what you write on your Facebook feed. And uh, that is quite, quite shocking. So we're going, I, I would say that if for people in South Africa that is aware about the situation in England and Tommy Robinson and the free speech problematic in England, we are not really right there yet in Sweden, but we are uh, closing up to it. Uh, the free speech in Sweden is more more oriented to ostracism, that you could get fired from the job, that you can be expelled from different working unions. And uh, for my conference on Sunday, if I were completely honest with the venue where we are going to hold the conference, we wouldn't be allowed to uh, hold the conference there. So people will buy a ticket for this conference. They would know the place like in a read the regional place that it will be in Stockholm and they know the time, but I haven't written out the actual venue yet because if I do, the left-wing extremist in, uh, in Antifa will contact the venue owner and uh, threaten him and say that if you rent it out to, to the Borough project, we will, uh, we will hurt you and I will stand without a venue. 
Sure. So I'm I'm rent, I'm renting the venue under a under a compass, company name. Uh, it's a supporter that owns a company, and he is willing to to take that risk with his own company. So it's it's like on paper, it's his company that is holding a conference as has invited his South African speakers. No, I mean, firstly, just from our side, we'd like to commend you. I mean, for your courage it's, as you've experienced this ostracism firsthand with the uh, MMA and the, and the kickboxing. And just lastly, to summarize the situation in, in Sweden, for someone who's probably outside of the internet, people who still live in the mainstream media bubble, do they, I mean, does the mainstream media acknowledge these segregated no-go zones as we've seen pop up in, in Sweden? Uh, no, no, they do, they do not. Uh, what they do is just they play with the term no-go zone and what it means. And... Uh, uh, they, they try to fill it with another meaning like that okay we acknowledge that it's some problems in these uh, areas but we can't call it no-go zones because of reasons but uh, what I like to tell to them is because like a no-go zone we, we are a social creature and uh, we're made up with uh, a biological instinct and if you're outside your home or area or region and you're walking there and you're walking walking around relaxed and don't need to think about like safety or whatever you're in a safe place but if your body starts to tell you that like okay this seems like a high risk area i need to look over my uh, uh, shoulder i get an increased pulse i start to sweat like then you are as an individual in a no-go zone like due to just basic human natural instinct. And all those established media that uh, goes out with these lies that no-go zones doesn't exist would not walk around in these areas casually. That would not happen. In terms of the way you've faced adversity just by speaking up about the situation in South Africa, I can imagine it, and, and as you've pointed out, it's not exactly any different there in Sweden. The other thing that, that is of interest to us in terms of mainstream media attention regarding the situation here in South Africa, what's that like in Sweden? Is there any mainstream media coverage of issues such as farm murders, as well as most of the political happenings going on currently in South Africa? The latest time I actually saw something in mainstream media in Sweden regarding farm attacks and uh, uh, civil unrest in South Africa and uh, the problems that you're facing, that's actually from Eugene Terblanche's funeral. That was actually quite uh, quite well covered in the Swedish media and pretty, pretty nuanced, actually, I must say. I was surprised about it. But uh, besides that, it's quite, it's quite quiet. Uh, it's from you see it from alternative medias, which uh, in Sweden is very very big. Uh, I would say that uh, we have the best uh, alternative media structures in in Europe uh, compared to like uh, Capita and uh, the influence uh, of the reach within the population. And uh, in, the alter- in the alternative media, you get a good uh, coverage, and that starts to awake uh, the Swedish population. And because we cover it in the alternative side of things, people are starting to put pressure on the established parties and the established media. And uh, it was uh, the state television uh, foreign correspondent in Johannesburg got uh, so many inbox lost, uh, what is it, like two, three months ago. So he needed to actually write a debate article uh, taking this up uh, and uh, he called it uh, a white supremacist conspiracy that uh, <laughs> whites are being targeting because they are whites in South Africa. And uh, he said that uh, what we see in South Africa is due to uh, like problem with high crime and that you have high crime in the black uh, black areas as well and in black township and you got some inter-tribal uh, dynamic between the blacks as well and whites are just in the mix of that. And what he missed to point out is that black kills blacks. Yeah, sh- sure, I don't deny that. And uh, whites kills whites. But it's not white that kills blacks. It's blacks that kills whites. And uh, that needs to be uh, addressed. 
and that is very, very skewed. And also one thing that is very problematic with uh, when the mainstream media actually writes something about it, it's that they use the same rhetoric that the ANC and the EFF use, and that is to referring to the Boer community as settlers uh, and uh, implying that the original sin in the country is due to uh, that the Boers are colonizers, which... uh, of course, is uh, for everyone that is well read on the South African history knows that it's it's a very very biased way of describing things uh, to to the to the black tribes. Presumably, that sort of bias would also have been in all in all the mainstream media sources during the eighties in Sweden, as well as the early nineties. Uh, surely, the coverage of any of the issues going on in South Africa was just as biased. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, the, the, it was stronger bias in the 70s and 80s because then it was very, very outspoken that uh, the whites are colonizers in Africa, all of Africa. And uh, why the white is successful in Africa is because they have uh, explorated the black uh, inhabitants. They have uh, suppressed them to benefit themselves. That the whites in South Africa has wealth because the black man in South Africa is poor. It's a very easy uh, mathematical equation that they are doing, which is like a uh, very, very naive way of regarding economics. Yeah, it, it's, it seems like it's uh, something that's based purely on emotion and feeling and gathering uh, mm-hmm. sympathy rather than uh, stating any real facts. Yeah, and that, that, that's the thing. It's like uh, if you're conflict avoidance uh, in, in, in your way of speaking, then you're... Uh, are not so interesting in actual facts because facts can be confrontative and actually hold some truth that uh, needs to uh, that burst the illusions that people are living in and appealing to people's emotions then uh, then you are liked <laughs> which uh, Olof Palme actually was in big uh, big parts in Sweden even though he was very very disliked in in other parts especially in the, in the very small right-wing fraction that were in Sweden during that time. Speaking of uh, facts and realities, you've made an effort to visit South Africa. You've filmed a documentary. You've given interviews to many prominent South Africans whilst you were here in South Africa, all part of your Boer Project documentary. Uh, and just a note to the listeners, if you haven't watched it, please do. It's a very good uh summation of what happens here in South Africa. There's a lot of uh, uncomfortable truths contained in that documentary. While we're on the subject, uh, Jonas, just please tell us a bit more about how you managed to get the documentary done uh, and also regarding your experiences here in South Africa while you were filming. Yeah, I, I think I need to like just say that I have a long history with uh, South Africa. I started to like uh, go back and forth from 2008 and uh, the more that time that went closer to present time, I felt that something was really needed to be to be done about the awareness uh, in Sweden about what's happening in South Africa. I have uh, over the years written a lot of articles and uh, got lots of stuff published, and uh, but I never got a re- really really good breakthrough of actually like cutting through the other kind of noise that is in society when it comes to information flow. So uh, I was starting to think about a documentary in uh, yeah, pretty much exactly one year from now, like end of August, early September last year. And uh, I started to think about it and uh, I started to count on it, what kind of budget I needed. And I started to assemble a team that uh, could uh, could help me with it, with... Uh, a camera crew and the, and the editing stuff. So we launched a campaign to raise the funds in uh, early November last year. And we set the limit for 100,000 crowns, which is roughly 130, 140,000 rand. And uh, it just took a couple of weeks and uh, we have uh, gotten more than we needed. So we booked the tickets and uh, we flew down the second week in January this year, and uh, we filmed for two weeks, two very intense week in the Johannesburg region. 
and uh, we flew back home to Sweden and uh, we worked nonstop with uh, with the editing process and we had a premiere in the beginning of Mars and um, and now we have uh, I don't know close to three hundred thousand views on uh, YouTube on the on the movie. This is very funny if we go back to our previous discussion about uh, how you need to deal with uh, Sweden because like it, it might be legal but you could be like ostracized or get uh, denied to rent a venue. So uh, I knew this with this uh, documentary as well. So I rented uh, first a cinema in central Stockholm and uh, they refused uh, due to uh, the character of the documentary that it highlights whites as a victim and it goes against the left-wing narrative that whites is always the oppressor. And uh, then I rented another cinema and I also were reacted there when they found out what kind of documentary I was going to show. And then I rented a cinema under a company from a supporter, like the same way I'm doing now. So we managed to get that cinema and we showed the movie in that uh, in that cinema. And uh, the day after, you could read in the local newspaper how the Boer project had uh, rented a cinema to show us a movie that uh, glorifies apartheid. That's what they read out of it, uh, which is complete, utterly nonsense. It's ridiculous for anyone that have seen the movie. It's, I don't even bring up apartheid on the on the table. I just, uh, I, the only question I ask is a rhetorical question, and that rhetorical question is that if we see some kind of like reversed apartheid today in South Africa when it comes to race, discriminate, race discriminatory legislations. That's definitely the case. It seems like uh, the government is, is ever increasing its, uh, its reach, uh, especially where things like a land expropriation without compensation mm-hmm. is, is concerned. Uh, also with a lot of the developments that lead to lots of civil tension, civil unrest, and it seems like the ANC and the EFF, a lot of these uh, left-wing uh, communist, socialist political parties are causing unrest and, and, and getting their supporters all riled up. And, and what you see is the inevitable results such as uh, farm murders as well as land being forcibly taken. Although it hasn't started in full, uh, there's definitely lots of talk about it. So it, it's definitely a good example of what can happen to uh, the rest of the the white world, so to speak, if uh, if demographic replacement, uh, demographic shift isn't at least curbed to some extent. Yeah, I could I couldn't agree more. With regards to your Burr Project documentary, what were some of the difficulties you faced while being in the country? Uh, and, and adding to that, many of the realities you faced here. Are they as as severe as what many people here in South Africa make them out to be? Uh, Or is it just uh, far-right propaganda, as some people might say? The first first question is like everything actually went very smoothly for our project uh, filming this. Uh, partially because I, I'm, I'm quite a good organizer and uh, that's what I do for, for a living as well. But I also had help from my uh, very good mate, uh, Stefan de Braun, whom I've known for quite some time. And uh, he's a boer living in, uh, in the Johannesburg region. And uh, he my, was my contact uh, in place and uh, did a tremendous work uh, by uh, setting up the different meetings and uh, sorting out some contacts. So I had very, very little friction actually getting good interviews and uh, getting good sites to film. And uh, it, it's like South Africa is a, is a funny country in this regard because as a foreigner, you can travel to South Africa and you can feel uh, perfectly safe and you can actually enjoy yourself uh, without anything happen for quite some time. But it's first now when... Uh, you actually start as a tourist or someone who is in the country for over some period of time, start to interact with the general population and start to talk about them, with about what's happening in their life. And you suddenly get a complete different picture of the country. You, you can't barely find an African that doesn't 
have a close relative or has been suffered from uh, that you have a friend or family member that has been brutally murdered or raped it's like you you need to look hard to find anyone that, who doesn't have that connection so and it's it's so easy for for the left wing establishment both in south africa and also overseas to for to p- scream right wing extremists as soon as someone lifts up these kinds of problem because you're not just lifting up this problem. You are also saying something while you're doing it. And without like saying it outspoken, but acknowledging problem is also acknowledging that this far left wing extremist policies in, in your country doesn't work. And if that policies doesn't work in South Africa with the rainbow nation, then people will start to ask, why would this rainbow policies work in Europe or America? And uh, therefore, I think it's a self-defense measure for them to scream right-wing extremists as soon as someone actually starts talking about these these questions. Yeah, I think if you if you stay in South Africa for a long enough time, then uh, statistical politics in a way, and that's obviously what's happening in Sweden as there's been a crime wave last few years, and obviously. See, that's the rest as well through the mainstream media. But, well, first, we're glad you had a, had a safe trip here. But, yeah, the reality people have to understand is if you live here for a certain amount of time, it's um, it's just a matter of time until you are, in a way, uh, a victim of some kind of crime or, as you say, more harsh crime and give you this this sense of trepidation with which you live every day because you know our crime is just close to the day, to the day that it's inevitably going to happen, and uh, in a way that is what we would hope Swedish people would understand from how we live. And obviously, you saw how people live in Joburg, and you basically live in a small, small castle for uh, yeah, for yeah, protection. definitely. It's it's like you you're not just victim of crime; you are also victim for your own security measurements. It's like it's it's not the sure. way yeah. children and the younger generation should. Uh, be raised behind bars they're being raised like inmates in a prison just to bring in another topic that we thought was also relevant especially in terms of the way south africa is currently the societies how the society is formed and how how things are currently you've written a book called anarcho-fascism nature reborn and in this book specifically there are a few truths that I think are relevant to South Africa's current situation, especially the book focusing on strengths and ideals that firstly men should have, especially natural aspects to masculinity that men should be defensive and basically uh, back to where they naturally are. Uh, Other aspects also covered in your book is ideas such as the state, natural forms of aggression, even things like what it takes to be uh, sovereign and uh, delving into ideas where sovereignty as well as basically natural ideals are concerned. We've touched upon especially the way that the state has degenerated, how the state has basically become this uh, totalitarian set up not only in Sweden, but the South African government has proven itself to be quite uh, moving towards uh, drastic measures every day. And uh, if you could just perhaps please tell the audience a bit more about your book and what led you to to writing it uh, and to exploring ideas within in the book. Yeah, so it's a very interesting question and it's an extremely interesting uh, topic. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a critique against the modern world and uh, how we regard society today that uh, we found ourselves in uh, this social constructing view that uh, the humans are just a blank slate and uh, we can fill it whatever we want. And uh, apparently we have gone in a completely wrong direction to actually be able to live a happy and safe life. And the subtitle Nature Reborn is uh, you can regard if you have gone in a wrong direction then the default setting should be to start to go back to what you actually are and not to what you might want to be, which is a major difference. It's like 
all right, maybe we want gender equality, but it's still when it comes uh, to the show, it's it's guys that will fight and defend uh, the tribe. And uh, somewhere along, along the line of this progressive society, we have lost uh, the essence of uh, of lots of like truth that is not just true right now, but it's true over time and that needs to be reconsidered. And one of those could be where where, uh, where the power of politics come in, why we actually vote, uh, that we vote to get a peaceful decision. But that peaceful decision is based on the different power balance between how the vote is being cast. And it's nothing more than that. And a majority vote doesn't mean that uh, you have a moral right or like a nature right to oblige to it. And uh, you see that especially in South Africa where ANCs constantly repeat that that they will not take the land unlawfully. They will make it legal to take it land and then the Boers must uh, hand it over to them. And that's that's not uh, what uh, what will happen. It will come down to what nature intended. And that is a power struggle of who is willing to fight for it and uh, who will succeed in it. And that's the part that will will own the land in the in the long run. It's, it has nothing to do with human rights or anything like it. Yes. I'm, firstly, I'd just like to commend you about the book. It's really a fascinating read. And, you know, I'd just like to maybe get your thoughts on if if the initial, if you read the the, the title, which is Anarcho-Fascism, I, I tend at first to think that that sounds like a, a contradiction. And, you know, how are you going to, how are you going to melt these two topics together? But the more I read and more I'm trying to see what you're, what you're doing with the two topics, I, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but this, um, it's in a way you're trying to, to, uh, kind of picture it as a duality within us. And you're trying to extend that duality of anarchism and, and fascism, um, which we see kind of as a biological nature in ourselves. And you're trying to, to extend it into sort of a, a political framework in a, in a bigger community. So if I can summarize that, it's in a way of saying, you know, we're, we're all in a way anarchists in that we want the maximum amount of freedom so that we can have the maximum amount of choice um, while still giving up certain freedoms, some like in discipline and that. And in a way we're we're kind of all fascist genetically because we have in-group preference. And, you know, as any parent can attest to that, you do, uh, you are kind of a fascist around your family. You will protect them and serve them as much as you can. And it is, you know, I feel that you're kind of trying to portray that duality uh, in biology and trying to extend that into a larger uh, political viewpoint. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah I think I think that was very well uh, put uh, because uh, that's uh, just on uh, on target. And uh, we need to extend it uh, to our extended family and not just to our immediate family to realize that we, we live under the safety of others. And uh, to be certain to continue living, those others need to have the same kind of identification factors that, ourse- that we ourselves are, so you don't be targeted as an enemy. And a real-life example would be like, okay, so say that you're a white left, liberal uh, boer and uh, you're voting for ANC but when the ANC come to take your farm they don't care that you vote for them they see the color of your skin and see that you don't belong there sure. so wh- whether or not you want it you need to team up with your own uh, with your own side and that's uh, the like an eternal truth that we need to realize otherwise we will be plain history and forgotten in a generation or two because then we won't be around here anymore. And yes, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that, you know, obviously you wrote it very well if, if I was able to understand it that easily. And another, I mean, I just want to get your sort of idea just to summarize it because, uh, you know, as thinking about this duality, the, the big issue, meaning how are we going to find the most success in a society is where do you draw those, those lines? Where, where is your boundary? Sort of, where's your boundary where your, where your fascism ends and say where your anarchism begins? I don't really know how to say that, but I'm sure you know what I mean. Yeah. Where would you say biologically 
you know, thinking about, you know, you know, because at the moment we're, we're this mesh and amalgamation of, of culture and brainwashing and tyranny. And then, you know, you obviously have uh, genetics and in group preference thrown in. Where do you see that natural biological boundary where you think societies would be able to, to thrive optimally? And, you know, as for example, obviously, you know, we, the world is kind of saturated with race, which, you know, I don't know if we can get away from it. I don't know if biologically we, we, we're able to, um, obviously you don't, you, you still want a, a bit of inclusion and even in a family group, it's quite of a small genetic group. Uh, yeah, so I'm just my, my thoughts about where do you draw that line? Yeah, I, I don't think it's a fixed answer uh, because uh, I think the answer is the checks and balance. And uh, that checks mm. and balance is uh, uh, three parts. It's both within your own group because uh, as a leader, you need to consolidate with your uh, people that are under you because otherwise they will tear you apart and uh, put a new leader in place. But it's also a check and balance to the direct environment that you exist within. It's like life is also a struggle against nature itself mm. to, to subdue the nature and overcome it. And the thirdly, the check and balance is, is against external groups that uh, you need to adapt the system within your own group, depending on what threat uh, you are facing on the groups on the other side. And I think when it comes to the freedom aspect to it, I think that would be the strongest uh, uh, factor for actually allowing a great deal of uh, free market uh, principle within your own community. Because w what this might, if it's not both the power of might, is both uh, brains and brawns. Mm. And uh, when it comes to a civilized society where we are industrialized and organized in those measures, it's... Uh, brains have overtaken so much of it so we need to allow that kind of freedom to actually be able to produce that power that is necessary to withstand any external threat that is out there and yeah. then we have like a perfect example of uh, yeah if you take second world war where america is based on free market principles and they uh, produced more fighter uh, fighter planes than the rest of the world combined due to that those principles were in place. And uh, if they America were too hard market uh, regulated, they wouldn't be able to produce that kind of force that uh, made them win, win the war. And that is like quite a non-controversial statement to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so to answer that question is like uh, I don't, I don't have an answer to that question. It's, uh, it's only due to the circumstances uh, around you, uh, based on uh, on the different power balances in place. Yeah, I mean, I could, you know, I, I personally sway towards an, an an anarchistic viewpoint, but I, I really have, you know, as you, you 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 know, you really put these two ideas together quite well, and I always have a very difficulty in you know separating what people would say is sort of the most practical or a consequentialistic view and what is a moral view. Obviously, I think there uh, there is moral differences between anarchism and, and fascism, but in the end, you know, reality reigns and it is generally if if if, if a community is more powerful than you, then you, you are gonna you are gonna come second. Maybe just lastly on that point, the if you look back in history, it is sort of empirical data shows us that very few if any governments that form ever stay small and that is probably sort of a one em em empirical uh critique i have of this idea that you you can have a state and still maintain sort of anarchy within it just because you know as we know even as your example as you mentioned now with america um it 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 has now turned into a very much a police state yeah um, and you know, it, it, as you said, it was one of the greatest free market countries, probably, I don't know if the world will ever see. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm torn, um, as I say, between, between this idea and it's a, it's a really good illustration. Yeah. And it's, it's also like we started a conversation that the book is written as a critique at the modern time. So it's also like, uh, I, I try to identify what's at the core level, what's wrong with our society. And uh, so uh, 
when I talk about the, the forms of the like the fashion, the need of actually stick together with people who are capable of continuing with the policies with other means than just going to the <laughs> to the ballot every fourth years. And that this, uh, we, we might come to a situation where we need to defend ourselves, not maybe by, by the direct use of force from the state, but uh, by the gangs of others within our own society. And then we need to realize that the safety f- for those that I care about, I, I can't put it uh, on a subcontractor, which is the state in normal circumstances. I need to take personal responsibility for it. And if I take personal responsibility for it, I also need to make sure that the people around me, that it's, uh, that is a mutual beneficial. That, mm. and that, that you see in, uh, both in South Africa, but also in America with, uh, with the organization of the neighborhood watches, the farm watches, and, uh, more in America, more outspoken with, uh, with the actual militias. Yeah. In respect to, Personal responsibility. I think one of the big things that we face here in South Africa, and I'm sure also it's the same in Sweden and the West at large, is that idea of personal responsibility. There aren't enough people that realize that that's actually how you should, uh, that, that it's natural to take responsibility for yourself instead of going after others. Your book is divided into three parts, the lie, the war, and the state. And to maybe just touch upon those three topics, especially to tie into what you just mentioned with the militias in the United States and so on. Now, in your third part of the book, the state, you mentioned, and I, I would, I'm would, i just going to read a quote from the book uh, to, to just give an idea. The state is an entity that, if unrestrained, is an absolute, it is the central power base within a set geographical area, one that no other entity can dominate or even oppose. To compromise with another political entity is to limit your own leeway, an unacceptable act to the state. For that reason, it was poetically beautiful to witness the political struggle that unfolded at the Bundy Ranch in 2014. Now, This is a very interesting case because it deals with the state wanting to take land or trespassing on land of a farmer or what what would be termed in America a rancher. And um, this was an example of of people coming together and taking, I wouldn't say necessarily taking up arms against the government, but defending their property, defending their land against government intrusion. Mm -hmm. And never more has such an example been as pertinent as to South Africa's situation. Uh, could you perhaps please just tell the audience a bit more about that situation, the Bundy, Bundy Ranch and what happened there and what led to that situation? Yeah, uh, and I couldn't agree more that this is actually um, applicable to South Africa and it's a, one of many possible uh, uh, scenarios that we that we can see it in your country in, in the near future and uh, with, with uh, see if I get all the facts straight in my head but uh, the Bondi ranch is uh, is uh, a cattle ranch in in Nevada and uh, they haven't been due to uh, uh, subdued to a tax a federal tax for their cattle to uh, use some of the surrounding around the farm for uh, for for eating and that tax was uh, tax was later uh, imposed and uh, the bond the family bond the family refused to pay that tax and uh, claimed that it was unconstitutional and this resulted in uh, that the state and the, the, the RS sent out the feds to uh, uh, take the, the cattle in uh, in custody like uh, as a hostage to actually get the money. We, we don't get the money, so we take the cattle instead of money. And uh, Bondi, being a member of a militia uh, and supported by several militias, uh, so those militias mobilized and uh, went out to... Uh, and it, it needs to be no, uh, stated that these militias are legal in accordance to the American Constitution. So uh, these militias went out and they took a stand with Bondi that this uh, tax was unconstitutional and that the state doesn't have the right to take the cattle of that. 
so, so we on one side have the federal agents, and on the other side that we have the uh, militias, and the, between them we actually have the state uh, police, the the state uh, sheriff of the town uh, together with the state police, trying to maintain law and order within its own state, and they were located between the the two. Uh, parts of the federal agents and the, and the militia. And uh, it was a proper standoff where they had sniper on both sides aiming at each other and uh, no one was seen to like be able to fold, which made the state actually to fold, which is like unprecedented in in situation like this. And which is weird why it had not been like covered more in the mainstream press. And uh, that could be a, a reason why it hasn't. So uh, the feds uh, fall back and the states decided to play a different strategy against the Bandar Ranch and that mm-hmm. is to, to suffocate them uh, on, the, on the long run through the long court cases. And it's still today not uh, settled uh, completely. And the things related to this is, uh, this wasn't directly to this, but uh, I'm not sure if you remember, it was uh, a militia member that got uh, pretty much executed by the feds uh, a year ago uh, in America. I don't re- really remember exactly the, the circumstances, but it was related to some kind of, same kind of dynamics. So it's a constant balance between the state and the people that uh, it should protect of what level of trespassing is are we as citizens going to to allow and uh, the boundary ranch uh, si- situate that uh, it actually is possible to come together and uh, withstand the states in uh, in regards to this and when we talk land expropriation without compensation the, the this is a, I, I find it a likely scenario to to take place, and uh, what what happens after that is uh, written in the stars. It's impossible to say how the ANC government will will react to that, but you will get some kind of reaction, and uh, definitely a reaction from the outside outside South Africa as well. Yeah, I think the big the big difference, and as you quoted the the case in America, that well, I'm sure most of the boos are well armed. But uh, the big difference is that the South African white population here is definitely not as well armed as we see in America. But again, you could say the same that the uh, the South African government is definitely not as efficient as and militarized as that in America. So maybe that's a, a yeah, you see, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a different different dynamic, and yeah, and it's not just being good armed and actually having a possible chance of winning that firefight uh, it's also a matter of like taking a stand and I've talked to South African farmers who says like I will stand here and die with my old uh, repeater rifle which like hardly works <laughs> uh, so, so it's like uh, how much are those farmers willing to die and how much is the ANC government prepared to kill and yeah. how much is the outside world prepared to just watch? That, yeah. That's also yeah. a dynamic to it. Yeah, I think what, for me the, the big thing is I, I, you know, I agree with you hundred percent, and that's the same sentiment I heard when I talked to the farmers. Is that in a sense they are in a way sacrificial lambs to see whether the South African white populace will stand up. So in a sense, for me, the big reaction is not from from overseas or even from the farmers because we kind of know what they're going to do. The the question is, is there, can their reaction, you know, start the fire within uh, within the white, bigger white South African populace? Because if, you know, if, if all the whites stand up in response yeah. to what happens to the farmers, that is the real um, backlash that the government might be worried about. I mean, if you literally, if we, if all the whites stop paying tax today, then, this country, there's nothing to steal. There won't be anything to steal come the next tax year. So that that is it's 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 what they talk about. But you got you can't you can't boil the water too fast with a frog in it. Yeah, but they have yeah, perfected so. that technique. They have. 
Yeah, and it's, it's it's an interesting topic, and it actually brings us on uh, what I'm working on next on the Boer project, and that is uh, we're going to send some uh, Swedish guys uh, to uh, engage in uh, farm watch activity in uh, in the Transvaal region in uh, end uh, September. Wow, that sounds that sounds great. Yeah, well, and tell uh, of us course, more if you did. can, but obviously you don't want to give away anything you can't, but. No, no, it's a, it's a, it's a good experience for the, for the, for the guys. Uh, they're just in the early twenties. And, uh, of course they, they are aware of the situation that it's not like, quote, war. They, they're going down to actually work on a farm and like just take part of the farmer community and, uh, do whatever they can in the farm watch while, while they're working there. And they will be done for a couple of months. And I hope that the exchange will be beneficial that, uh, that uh, it will continue when when those goes home, and it's also like if you're going to be cynical about it, the reason why uh, America has troops in uh, in the Baltics in Europe, it's uh, too few to threaten Russia with an invasion, but it's just enough to be what could be called uh, a tripwire. That mm. if Russia were to go into Baltics, it will be on the result that American soldiers will die. And those deaths will uh, guarantee the Baltics the involvement of America. And in the same way, this is also a tripwire. If we have Swedish citizens engaging in lawful activity, working on a farm and take part in farm watch, and if they uh, is being attacked for being in the farming community, it's our tripwire for the Swedish uh, establishment not to be able to be uh, keep quiet anymore. Very interesting. Very interesting. It's a very good way to put it. Yeah. As we wind down, uh, what solutions do you propose we, uh, that us South Africans can start applying to improve the situation on our side, as well as any solutions that perhaps uh, people in Sweden might even benefit from? Just to bring up a few points in your book, you even mention the importance of technologies such as 3D printers, uh, even decentralized uh, infrastructure or decentralized technologies uh, as and, and it's stuff that we on this on this podcast prove of wholeheartedly what solutions do you propose uh, for those listeners who feel that okay maybe uh, the situation is a bit rough uh, the situation is hopeless what do i do where do i start uh, i think uh, that th- those tips that uh, or my take on it i think Lots of South African actually already started with it, uh, and uh, maybe it's more for the Sw- Swedish people or the rest of Western uh, civilized people that listening to it. But it's to actually to start to live your life as the state didn't exist. That you realize that uh, your life insurance is not uh, not the state; it's the people that you surround you with, and that you actually start to think about and formalize those uh, ties with the people around you and uh, start to think tribal, start to think that you are part of a tribe and those tribe is the people that are going to look after you and you're going to look after them and try to put so much resistance, legally resistant friction against the state as possible, be as in- inconvenient person as possible for the state to deal with within the uh, structures of the law like be that annoying kid at home that breaks the family until they throw you out on the street because they can't deal with you anymore like break the state from within by not taking part as a good citizen but as an uh, obedient citizen and stand and hold your ground surround yourself with people that will and should protect you and that you will and want to protect yeah, I always find it uh, kind of ironic that, you know, when uh, the sort of new South Africa started after apartheid and when the, the corruption of the ANC first became really evident, everyone always complained about all the nepotism with, within, the, within the government ranks and how that is the cause of, of, uh, of corruption. And in a way, it kind of, in my mind, it's gone full circle in that, you know, they're doing exactly what we should have been doing is, you know, employing yeah. nepotism which is basically tribal preference that if we did that and exactly that's what Urania is doing then um then you don't have to lock your doors and um 
it's uh, it's amazing even how 10 years ago I believed a few lies and um, now you realize how wrong you were. Yeah, no, no, it's a perfectly good point to start to think tribal. And that is also like a little white pill if you're familiar with that concept, like a little trust to the future. And that is the Boer population as a, as a tribe is... Is no less or more than any other tribe in South Africa as well. Why, what are you like? Eleven different tribes in South Africa and a population of 50, 60 million. And uh, you guys are three, three, four million. Yeah, it's about eleven official languages. I, 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 I can't give you an official count of how many tribes. It, it seems endless to me. But yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, but the, we, we've got. <laughs> yeah, we've it, got. It's, it's not uh, just a black-white dynamic. It's uh, no, of where course, it's intertribal yeah. and. Uh, you are just a exactly. tribe amongst the others. Yeah, I, I do think, I mean, there's this more for our own listeners. It is, you know, that when you really sit down and think about it, that you're right. The Afrikaner culture uh, is very much on the edge of extinction because if everyone just leaves and, uh, you know, infiltrates the rest of the world, then what you'll have in two, three generations is you'll have a loss of Afrikaner culture and Afrikaner genetics, you could say. Yeah, and it's genocide. In essence... Yeah, in, in essence, you know, it, it, it is a tough cross to bear, but you have to kind of look yourself in the mirror and realize that you are now responsible for keeping this, which has occurred in the last almost 400 years. You are now responsible for, um, for keeping it alive. And if everyone sort of really understood that urgency, then I think people will, will gather together and as you say, form a tribe a lot quicker. But maybe we just need, again, we we always speak like, what is the spark going to be that gets everyone together? But it's 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 really strange that it has not happened. And again, these things you can't predict, but hopefully that spark will happen soon. Yeah, I hope so. Jonas, once again, thank you for joining us on this podcast. We appreciated your insights and uh, appreciate the discussion we had with you. It, it was very, very interesting. Uh, we'd very much like to have you on again in the future, especially after the conference has happened and after you've uh, had some more time to especially bring out more content regarding South Africa. We'd very much love to discuss any any further happenings and occurrences within South Africa as well as in with, with regard to Sweden. We'd love to speak with you again. No, it would be my pleasure. We stay in contact. Also, just... Uh, Please give the listeners information as to where they can reach you, where they can find your contact and uh, any other relevant uh, information you'd like to share. Yeah, you, you can uh, go in and uh, support what I do on booerproject.com and uh, you can follow me on YouTube uh, where I put up the most of the content and that is on Palestra Media. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. If there is one more idea we wish to leave you with, it would be another small extract from Jonas's book. It is important and relevant for the times we currently live in. I quote, Freedom works like a muscle. If it is not exercised and strengthened through resistance, it will atrophy. Something that is supposed to be strong, functional and aesthetically desirable instead becomes decrepit, weak and disgustingly incapable of maintaining itself. The latter is the state hugger. We cannot see how we would survive if not for the regulations and subsidies of the state. End of quote. In conclusion, Jonas includes a quote from the Harvard Mall, and it is something to consider, especially in how we take responsibility for ourselves and how we choose to act. Cattle die and kinsmen die, and so one dies oneself. But one thing I know that never dies, the fame of a dead man's deeds. Thank you for taking the time to listen to another Boer Republic podcast. Please like, share and subscribe to our channel. And if this message resonates with you, please spread it as far as you can. Your support is appreciated. Any feedback is encouraged and we look forward to engaging with you on our various social media platforms. You can find us on Twitter, gab.ai, minds.com, Steemit, YouTube, DTube, BitChute and PewTube as well as on wrongthink.net. We update as regularly as we can, so please follow us and reach out to us. Until next time, stay safe wherever you may find yourself.